Welcome guys to Blood Physiology Lecture 8. So it's me again, Dr. Piri, taking you in blood physiology. So this is the last part of the blood physiology that we'll be discussing. So I hope by now you still remember what we've discussed. There is quite a lot of information that we've discussed from lecture one to lecture seven. Today we're looking at lecture eight. So I hope you are able to relate with all the lectures that I've given you and also the recorded videos that I'm also giving you. So like I said, today we'll be looking at the last part of blood physiology. We'll be discussing platelets and platelets, the other name for platelets are thrombocytes. So in this lecture, there is also quite a lot of information. So it's not possible for me to finish all the information in one session. So I'm going to split it into two sessions. We're going to have part A of the video where I'm going to discuss mainly we're going to look at the introduction to platelets and then we'll discuss from bucoesis, which is basically the process in which uh, platelets are formed. And then we are also going to look at hemostasis. Hemostasis, you're talking of blood clotting. Then after blood clotting, we are going to look at other systems that are capable of getting rid of a clot so that you don't have a thrombus that can block some blood vessel elsewhere in the cardiovascular system. So we have fibrinolysis that we're going to discuss as well. Then we're also going to look at disorders of platelets, platelets associated disorders. So like I said, this is quite a lot of information as well. So we're not going to manage to finish just in one session. So the first session, we're just going to look at introduction from bucoesis and hemostasis. After that, the part two of the video, I'm going to discuss fibrinolysis, and also anticoagulants that are found within the body. So you have the natural anticoagulants and fibrinolysis system. And then we're also going to look at disorders associated with platelets. Okay, so that's just the layout. So it means by the end of this class, you should be able to describe from bucoesis, you should be able to describe hemostasis and all the mechanisms that are involved, the pathways of hemostasis. We're going to discuss all that. That's just for Part A. So let's start. So now what you're looking at are uh, platelets. So the other formed elements we've already discussed. They are process in which they are produced and also disorders associated with red blood cells, white blood cells. We've already discussed that. So today we're just looking at platelets. Okay, so you can see that platelets are smaller than any other blood cells. So these are not basically referred to as cells, but cell fragments, because after the development of the megakaryocytes, the megakaryocyte is the one that will produce the platelets. So they are more like fragmentations of the megakaryocytes. So they are called cell fragments, not necessarily referred to as cells. Okay, so they are part of the formed elements. Like we say that blood is composed of 55% plasma and 45% formed elements. But Total blood is about 8% of your body weight, so that we know by now. So you know to say that of the formed elements, we have platelets. So you can see here that these are platelets. The normal number of platelets that an individual should have should be between 150,000 to 400 to 400,000 platelets per cubic the cubic millimeter of blood or per microliter of blood. So this is just a normal range of platelets that you should find in a normal human being. But sometimes due to pathology or certain diseases, you find that the platelet count can decrease or it can increase depending on the conditions that we'll be discussing towards the end of the class. So it's platelet formation of thrombopoiesis is just part of hemopoiesis. And hemopoiesis is the process by which formed elements are formed within the bone marrow and other structures that can also participate in hemopoiesis. So let's start with the introduction to thrombocytes or platelets. So what are platelets? Platelets are blood cells. So it's questionable to call them blood cells, but it's more convenient to call them cell fragments. So these platelets are cell fragments. They are smallest of the formed elements. So they are the smallest in terms of diameter. They are granulated bodies inside, so they also have granules. They are granulated. They are non-nucleated biconvex disc. So they are biconvex in terms of shape. 
So these platelets are non-nucleated, so you don't find nucleus within the platelets, but they do have granules. In terms of diameter, I said they are smallest, so they are about two to four micrometer in diameter, so they should be the smallest because they are just like fragmentation of the cells. In the circulating blood, there are about 150,000 to 400,000 platelets per microliter of blood, like I've already said, so this is just a normal range. The lifespan of platelets, they can survive for about five to 10 days. So you know to say after 10 days, they'll be destroyed by uh, other systems like the spleen, they're also involved in destruction of these platelets. So you remember the reticular endothelial system that is involved there. Then you also have, <clears throat> in terms of platelets, there are also other platelets that are trapped within the spleen. So about one third of the platelets are trapped within the spleen. So it means if you undergo splenectomy or the removal of the spleen, it means that you are removing about one third of platelets. So that can result into low platelet count when you remove a spleen. In terms of function, platelets, they are essential for blood clotting, so they're involved in hemostasis. So we're going to discuss that as well. So we proceed in terms of structure, they also have a cell membrane, just like any other cell, they have a cell membrane, but like we said, that platelets are not referred to as cells, but cell fragments. But as the megakaryocyte is forming these platelets, you have budding off of these platelets. So as they are budding off, they will bud off with the plasma membrane of the megakaryocyte. So they also have a cell membrane, just like the megakaryocyte. And then inside them, we have microtubules, the cytoskeleton, and also the cytoplasm, just like any other cell. So you can see from the megakaryocyte, the one that is producing the platelets in the bone marrow, we have this smaller fragmentation of the megakaryocytes, and this fragmentation are the ones that are, we are referring to as platelets. So you can see they have cell organelles inside those structures within the platelets. So these structures, they'll have different function. So you can see that you have the membrane here or the cell membrane or the platelet then going inside you have the cytoplasm within the cytoplasm you have a lot of cell organelles that are suspended inside so you have the microtubules like the cytoskeleton or the platelet that are involved in giving the discoid shape of the platelet then you can also appreciate the glycogen store so you have the glycogen store here that are also involved in anaerobic respiration for the production of ATP without using oxygen. So you can see the breakdown of glycogen into glucose and then glucose will be broken down to pyruvate. That process, glycolysis will produce energy for the metabolism that are taking place within the platelets. And then you have different types of granules. You have the density granules and the alpha granules. The density granules are the ones that will contain chemicals like ADP. They can also contain serotonin, they can also contain other chemicals that we'll be discussing. And then you also have the alpha granules. The alpha granules are the ones that will contain proteins, and these proteins mainly they are protein factors and also enzymes. Then you can also see in the cytoplasm, you have the mitochondrion or mitochondria. They are not a lot here, so you don't expect much of energy coming from the mitochondrion because they are not a lot within the platelets, and then you can also have rhizosomal granules. Rhizosomal granules, they contain enzymes that are capable of digesting anything. Then you also have metabolites that are coming from metabolism. Then you also have canalicular system. The canalicular system are the ones when the platelets are activated, they will result into changing on the shape of the platelets because you also have the contractual system within the platelets like the actin, mousin, and other proteins that are involved in contraction of the platelets and also the changing of the shape of the platelets. So this is just the general structure of platelets. So it's the same diagram here. So you can, here you can appreciate the microtubules, the density tubules, and then you also have uh, the glycogen storage or store. You have the mitochondria, then you also have the alpha granules and the density granules. So the alpha granules and the density granules, they are also involved in hemostasis because they produce certain chemicals and enzymes that are necessary for blood clotting. 
Okay, so the structure of the cell membrane in terms of thickness is about six nanometers thick and they contain a lot of carbohydrates, proteins and lipids. So the carbohydrates, they are referred to as glycocalyx and then you also have the, glyco, uh, the, the proteins, the glycoproteins, the lipids, you have the phospholipids, cholesterol and glycolipids. So these proteins and the lipids, some of the proteins function as receptors and these lipids, some of them, they can activate coating factors. So in terms of function, the most important are the glycoproteins because the glycoproteins are the ones that will form receptors. Then the phospholipids, the phospholipids, they can also activate coating factors as we'll be discussing later on. Okay. So because we said the most important are glycoproteins and phospholipids. So just a bit of information on the glycoproteins. What is the function of the glycoproteins? Like I've already said, they will function as receptors in most cases. So they will play a key role in chemostasis. So for human platelets, the membrane glycoproteins act as receptors that mediate two important functions. So they will function as receptors that will have two major functions. The first one, adhesion to subendothelial matrix. So there are receptors that can adhere to, to subendothelial matrix. Within the subendothelial matrix, you can have collagen, and then you have other factors like van Wira brand factor. So these glycoprotein, like I said, they function as receptors, so they can go and attach to them. So they will facilitate in ad adhesion of platelets to those extracellular structures or the subendothelial structures. And then they also function as platelet, platelet cohesion or aggregation, ag aggregation. So for these platelets to go and bind to other platelets, they also go and bind to these glycoproteins because the glycoproteins are the ones that will act as receptors. So the glycoproteins from one platelet, they can also go and bind to the glycoprotein of another platelet to form that aggregation. So the cohesion and aggregation of platelets is also facilitated by these glycoproteins. Then when blood vessel wall is damaged, platelets glycoprotein interact with the extracellular matrix that will accelerate the adherence of platelets to collagen and also damage endothelium in ruptured blood vessels. So when you have ruptured blood vessels, you find that there's collagen that will be exposed and this glycoprotein, like we said, they will function as receptor. So they are able to go and bind to that collagen. And this binding of glycoprotein to collagen is facilitated by Van Weyerabend factor. Then the glycoprotein they also prevent adherence of platelets to normal endothelium. So if you have normal endothelium, you find that collagen is not exposed, so you have normal smooth endothelium. Because you have this normal smooth endothelium, we find that platelets can't really bind the smooth endothelium. So there is need for them to be damaged for platelets to come and bind. So those receptors will facilitate these platelets not to bind because they are specific to certain structures that are found within the subendothelial matrix, like collagen and van Weyerabrand factor, like I've already mentioned. So they also form a receptor for ADP and thrombin. So thrombin can attach, ADP can also attach to, to these glycoproteins. So you find that once platelets are activated, they will release the contents of the granules and these contents of the granules, some of them are ADP and this ADP can go and bind to the glycoprotein of another platelet. So once they bind, they will activate those platelets, they will become sticky. That will facilitate those platelets to go and bind to other platelets for the plug formation of the platelets or so platelets plug formation. The glycoproteins are also receptors for fibrinogen and factor van Weyerabrand factor. So like I said, that these glycoproteins, they can also bind to van Weyerabrand factor or the fibrinogen. The phospholipids include platelet factor three. So these phospholipids, some of them, they are called platelet factor three, but its major function is not known at the moment, but just not to say that the phospholipids they're involved in activation of certain uh, clotting factors, like I've already mentioned. So we also have the microtubules. These microtubules, just to give structural support to the platelets to maintain that discoid 
shape. So they are made up of cuberins. These are proteins and it's responsible for the discoid shape of platelets, like I've already said. These are microtubules. Then in the cytoplasm, we have a lot of cell organelles. So these cell organelles, we have the contractual proteins that are involved in retraction of the, the, the plug. After plug formation, you need the, the platelets to contract so that it reduces in volume because if it's so big, you find that it can obstruct the movement or it can occlude the blood vessel. So you need this clot to contract or to reduce in size. So how does it reduce in size? It's because within the platelets, you have the contractual proteins that will facilitate the contraction of the, the platelets and also to change in shape after activation. So you also have the Golgi apparatus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, the rhizosomes, the, the glycogen granules, the enzymes, chemical substances, and also granules. So you have the alpha granules and the dense granules that are found within platelets. So we're still discussing platelet structure. So cyto cytoplasm content and their function. So the same things that we are listing there, what, what would be their functions, some of them. So I've already told you to say the contractile proteins. Here you have actin, you have thrombosterin, thrombosterin, which is also protein that is involved in contraction. You have also mousy. Uh, the major function of these contractile proteins, they will enable activated platelets to change shape. So you find that they'll be able to change shape once they are activated. So it will change from discoid and then they'll be becoming more flat and then they'll have projections that will also attract other platelets to go and bind. The endoplasmic reticulum is involved in the synthesis of enzymes because you know to say the endoplasmic reticulum you can have ribosomes so it's involved in the synthesis of enzymes that are involved in stasis. Then the Golgi apparatus they store calcium. Calcium is very important when you're talking of the coagulation pathways so it's more like a cofactor. It's actually called cofactor or factor four. So this calcium is very necessary for hemostasis. So you find that some of these platelets, they'll have calcium that is stored within the Golgi apparatus. Once they are activated, they can also release this calcium. And you also know to say calcium is also important when it comes to contraction. So once you have release of calcium, there's interaction between actin and mousy that will allow the platelet to change shape and also for retraction of the clot. The mitochondria, and enzyme system, they're involved in the synthesis of ATP and ADP. So the production of adenosine triphosphate and adenosine diphosphate. Then lysosomes, they contain hydrolytic enzymes. So these hydrolytic enzymes, you know to say they are involved in digestion of a lot of substances. The glycogen granules for production of energy anaerobically. So you know to say that you have glycogen granules and these glycogen, they can be broken down into glucose and then this glucose will undergo anaerobic respiration whereby it will be converted into a pyruvate and that process will produce energy but without the utilization of oxygen. That's why it's called anaerobic process. Then you also have the enzyme system that synthesizes prostaglandins from phospholipids of platelet membrane. So within the phospholipids of the or, or the or the cell membrane of platelets, you have the phospholipids, and these phospholipids they can be converted into prostaglandins. And these prostaglandins they'll have an, a function in coating mechanism, as we'll be discussing later on. So you need these prostaglandins that are produced from phospholipids by these enzymes that are also found within platelets. The chemical substances that are found especially in the density granules. So in the density granules, you have these chemical substances. Then in the alpha granules, you have more proteins. So some of the chemicals that are found within the density granules, they have serotonin, adenosine, diphosphates mainly, but these are just chemicals that are found within the cytoplasm of the platelets. So you have calcium ions, you have magnesium ions, adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphates. Then the types of granules. So there are two major types of granules that are found within the platelets. Like I said, you have the density granules and the alpha granules. 
So you have the density granules that will contain non-protein substances. So they will have some of these chemicals listed above. So then they don't contain protein. So mainly the density granules will have ADP, adenosine triphosphates. They contain adenosine diphosphates, calcium, and serotonin. So these are non-protein substances that are found within density bodies or density granules. So a question sometimes can come for you guys to list what is found within the density granules and what is found within the alpha granules of platelets. So I should know to say in the density granules, mainly you have non-protein substances like ATP, ADP, calcium, and serotonin. But in alpha granules, this is where you find proteins. So in alpha granules, they contain secreted proteins, which could be enzymes. So you have the coating factors, which are proteins. Then you also have fibrin stabilizing factor, which is called factor 13. So the fibrin stabilizing factor is called factor 13. Then you also have platelet drive growth factor. So all these are found within the alpha granules. So the platelet drive growth factor after activation of platelets, you find that they'll start using these factors. And these factors will enhance angiogenesis or the development of blood vessels or repair of blood vessels. So they will cause repair of damaged smooth muscle cells and also damaged endothelium and also repair of the collagen fibers. So we have the growth factors that can stimulate that that are also found within the alpha granules. The general function of platelets or the function of platelets, mainly you have the plasma membrane of the platelets that contain glycocalyx and phospholipids. The glycocalyx, you have the glycoproteins. These glycoproteins will lead to result into or it can lead to the plug formation. This plug formation is as a result of platelets adhesion, because I've told you to say that these glycoproteins, some of them will function as receptors to which can go and bind to Van Wierer gland, and also they can bind to collagen. So they will go and bind to cause adhesion of platelets. At the same time, the glycoprotein can bind to other structures on the platelets that will result into platelets aggregation. So platelets aggregation, you have interaction of one platelet with another platelet that is binding to the site that is injured. So you have different types of these proteins that are involved in uh, platelet adhesion and platelets aggregation. So like I said, platelet adhesion here, this platelet adhesion, the protein that is involved here is van Willebrand factor. So the glycoprotein will go and bind to van Willebrand factor to cause adhesion of platelets to the injured site within the blood vessel. Then after that, you can have aggregation of platelets or stacking of platelets on top of each other. How do they stack? It's because how do they get stuck to each other? It's because they have the glycoprotein, which are receptors that can go and bind to other structures of another platelet. So these structures, we have the glycoprotein 2B and glycoprotein 3A. So the glycoprotein, glycoprotein 2B and glycoprotein uh, 3A are the ones that are involved in aggregation. And then the glycoprotein 1B is the one that is involved in adhesion. So adhesion, you have the glycoprotein 1B that can go and bind to Van Willebrand factor. Then you have glycoprotein 2B and 3A that is involved in platelets aggregation. So they are able to bind to other glycoprotein so that you have aggregation of platelets or forming a stack of platelets. The phospholipids, like I said, they're involved in activation of certain factors. So they can activate factor eight to uh, factor 10 to activated factor 10. So the inactive factor 10 can be activated into the active factor 10. That will result into conversion of prothrombin to thrombin and thrombin is the one that will activate fibrinogen into fibrin. So we'll look at that pathway later on. But just not to say that, these phospholipids, they are also involved in activation of coating factors. So they can function as cofactors to activate other factors. So that we'll discuss. So we proceed by starting looking at the thrombopoiesis 
This is platelet formation. So thrombopoiesis, platelet formation. So this is a process by which thrombocytes are formed or platelets are formed within the bone marrow. Remember, you still have the hematopoietic stem cell that can differentiate into, you have the long-term hematopoietic stem cell that can differentiate into the short-term hematopoietic stem cell that will later differentiate into multipotential stem cell, progenitor cell, then it can differentiate into committed cells. So some of them, they will differentiate into common myeloid progenitor cell and common lymphoid progenitor cell. From the common myeloid progenitor cell, this is where you have the mega karyoblast coming from. So that's the pathway that we're discussing. So here it is. So you have multipotential hematopoietic stem cell within the bone marrow, that would depreciate into the common myeloid progenitor cell. There are other steps here that you know by now. So it would depreciate into the common myeloid progenitor cell due to factors. You have the, the growth inducers and depreciation inducers that are stimulating this conversion. Then you have the megakaryoblasts. The megakaryoblasts will later on depreciate into promegakaryocyte. The pro-megakaryocyte, with the presence of other factors that we'll be discussing, especially the thrombopoietin, which is a hormone that will stimulate for it to differentiate into the megakaryocyte. And the megakaryocyte is the one now that will start shedding off platelets. This is the process by which platelets are formed. So this pathway is called thrombopoiesis, the process that will result into the formation of thrombocytes. Okay. So we proceed with thrombopoiesis, just adding some more information to it. So you can see from this diagram, they are basically the same steps that are involved. So you have the stem cell that will be stimulated by those factors. They need to undergo commitment, so it become committed cell. So you have these commitment steps that they're in between here. Then to transform into burst forming unit, megakaryocyte, and colon forming unit, megakaryocyte. Then these cells, they undergo differentiation. So you have the early differentiation, then it will form the immature megakaryocyte. This immature megakaryocyte will now have the terminal differentiation for it now to become the mature megakaryocyte. In the mature megakaryocyte is the one now that will start shedding off platelets. So you can see the process of poesis here, whereby the megakaryocyte, which is a bigger cell, it will start shedding off platelets. So in the development of blood cells in general, I told you to say there is change in terms of size. So you have a bigger cell that will start becoming smaller until it becomes the mature blood cell. For instance, red blood cells, you start with bigger cells that will be becoming smaller. Even for white blood cells, you have a bigger cell that will be becoming smaller. But with platelets, it's different. You have hematopoietic stem cell, which is bigger, and then it will start becoming bigger, bigger, bigger as they, they, as they are differentiating until you have the mature megakaryocyte, which is far bigger than the hematopoietic stem cell. So there's an increase in terms of size. And this mega cell, that's why it's called mega karyoblast or mega karyocyte. So this mega cell, which is very big now, it will be able now to start shedding off platelets. So from one uh, mature mega karyocyte, you can form about 1,000 platelets. So it's a lot of platelets from just one cell because it's so big. So I've already told you about the lifespan, and I've also told you to say one mega karyocyte will produce about 1,000 platelets. And per day, you have one times 10 raised to the power eight megakaryocytes that are generated within the bone marrow. So every day you're producing about one times 10 raised to the power eight megakaryocytes. And each megakaryocyte will produce about 1,000 platelets. So in a day, how many platelets are you producing? It's quite a lot of platelets that you're producing per day. So this is a change in terms of size as the cells are developing or differentiating. So starting with the megakaryoblast, which is a committed cell, it's committed to become platelets or to start shedding off platelets. So you can see here in stage one, where you have the hematopoietic stem cell 
committing itself by differentiating into the megakaryoblasts. And you know to say this megakaryoblast is generally coming from the common myroid progenitor cell. So you have this stage one where you have the megakaryoblast. In terms of size, it's greater than 10 micrometers. In terms of morphology, how it looks like, you have lobed nucleus in basophilic cytoplasm. Then it will differentiate into basophilic megakaryocyte. So this basophilic megakaryocyte is stage two. You can see there's an increase in terms of size from greater than 10 to greater than 20. Then inside it, you will find this a nucleus that looks like a horseshoe. So you have horseshoe shaped nucleus, basophilic cytoplasm. <clears throat> Then you also have azurophilic granules that are around the centrosome. Then it will differentiate into granular megakaryocyte. This is stage three. You can see the size is also increasing from 20 now to 25 to 50. So you have a large lobed nucleus. So you have this large lobed nucleus, and then you have azurophilic cytoplasm and a lot of <coughs> azurophilic granules inside. Then you also have the mature megakaryocyte, the mature megakaryocyte, this is stage four. So you can see also it's bigger. So it will have pycnotic nucleus that is condensed now. And then it will have also a lot of azurophilic granules. So this is the one now that will start shading off platelets. So this is just the development of platelets. It's called Thrombopoiesis, so it's basically the same information here. I've already explained how the progenitor cell will differentiate into committed cells, then later on, <clears throat> they will differentiate into colon forming units. And these colon forming units will undergo mitosis, then later on, after mitosis, will stop and then it will, end into, it will enter into endomitosis. The endomitosis is whereby the cell is not dividing, the nucleus is not dividing but there is proliferation of the DNA material. So because there is a lot of proliferation of the DNA material, it will result into formation of polyproid progenitors. And these polyproid progenitors, they will have a lot of genetic material, the DNA or the chromatin and also the chromosomes. That will result into the cell becoming bigger <clears throat> because the cell is no longer undergoing mitosis, but there is a lot of division of the DNA within the nucleus. So the nucleus is still intact, but becoming bigger because of that replication of the DNA. So this is what is happening. You can see you have the potential stem cell that will differentiate into committed cells, forming the megakaryocyte colon forming cells or stem cells, and they will stop undergoing mitosis. They'll enter into endomitosis. The endomitosis, you have replication of the DNA. That will result into the nucleus becoming bigger and the cells also becoming bigger. And these bigger cells are the ones that will start now shading off the platelets. <clears throat> so you have the, the mega, mega karyoblasts that will respond to cytokines. So there are a lot of cytokines that can stimulate the megakaryoblast for it to differentiate. So some of these cytokines, they will function as hormones or chemokines that will have an effect on the survival and proliferation of megakaryocyte. So the survival and proliferation of the megakaryocyte is dependent on the cytokines that are more like hormones. So some of these cytokines or hormones, you have thrombopoietin. The thrombopoietin is a hormone that is produced mainly by the liver and also by the kidneys. So this is a major hormone that is going to stimulate the megakaryoblast to differentiate into megakaryocytes, then also stimulating the megakaryocytes to start shedding off platelets. So this is a hormone that will increase the production of platelets. That's why it's called thrombopoietin. So it will go and bind to thrombopoietin receptors of these cells that are undergoing development. Then you also have cytokines like interleukin-3. And these interleukin-3, they can come from other white blood cells that are producing them and also other cells that are found within the bone marrow that can produce interleukin-3 that will function more like paracrine function by stimulating these uh, stem cells to start differentiating. Then you also have stem cell factor and you also have stroma cell drive factor. All these will have an effect on the megakaryoblast to differentiate into megakaryocytes. 
So like I said, the thrombopoietin is the one which is most important or critical with the function of platelets because it's the one that is stimulating the production of platelets. So if you do an experiment whereby you eliminate the gene that codes for thrombopoietin, you find that the production of platelets will reduce about 90%. So there will be 90% reduction in the production of platelets, meaning that the animal or the human being will only be producing about 10%. So it means that of these cytokines or hormones that are stimulating the production of platelets, the most important one is thrombopoietin, because it's the one that is responsible for production of 90% platelets. The other 10% are these other cytokines. So it's very important in the production of platelets. So megakarial blast signal transduction, how does now these cytokines stimulate the megakarial blast to undergo differentiation? The survival and proliferation of megakarial blast depends on at least two from the poetin induced signaling pathways. So there are signaling pathways that are induced by thrombopoietin. When thrombopoietin goes and binds to thrombopoietin receptors within these megakaryoblasts, it will trigger a signaling pathway inside of the megakaryoblast. So there are two signaling pathways that will be activated. You have the PIK pathway or mechanism, and you also have mitogen activated protein kinase, which is also called the MAPK. So these pathways will be activated. That will result into an increase in the transcription for the messenger RNA that is required for the production of platelets. So in simple terms, they are going to stimulate the production of platelets once they are triggered by the presence of these uh, from the protein hormone binding to the receptors of the megakaryoblasts. So you can see the effect here of from the protein action on these cells that are undergoing development. So its effect is more on the megakaryoblasts and megakaryocytes as they are undergoing development. So they will be expressing more of the receptors for thrombopoietin. So it will go and bind those cells for them to differentiate into the immature megakaryocyte, and then the mature will differentiate into the mature megakaryocyte. And this mature megakaryocyte is the one that will start now shading off the platelets with the presence of thrombopoietin. So that's the function of thrombopoietin. So a bit of information here. So you can see the plasma membrane of those cells that are undergoing development. You're talking of the megakaryoblasts and the megakaryocytes, the mature and mature megakaryocytes. So they'll have these receptors. So you have these thrombopoietin receptors. Without thrombopoietin hormone bound to it, you find that the receptor is inactive. So you have the inactive receptor. For it to be activated, you need the thrombopoietin to bind. So when thrombopoietin comes and binds to be activated, so you can see here now, that the receptor has been activated. Once it has been activated, it's going to activate the PI3 kinase, which will involve the JAK and start pathway. So the JAK is the Janus kinase that will end up activating the start. The start is the signal transducer and activator of transcription. That will result into signal transduction to increase platelet production. And then the other pathway is the one that will involve the MAPK, the mitogen activator protein kinase. This is another pathway. So the both pathways will increase the production of platelets. That's why you need from a point in for you to produce a lot of platelets to increase platelet production or thrombocytes production. <clears throat> so now you know how platelets are produced. So you also know the normal platelet counts in a normal person that should range from 150,000 to 400,000 platelets per cubic millimeter of blood or per microliter of blood. So how can you do a platelet count for you to ascertain how many platelets does this patient or this person have? So there's a technique. So it's also similar to white blood cell count, red blood cell count, we use the improved Nuba chamber. So the improved Nuba chamber can also be used to do platelet counts, but there are materials that you need to do platelet counts. So the materials that you need, so the principle here 
A platelet count is the enumeration of platelets, which are tiny cells, smaller than red blood cell, which help the blood clot. So these tiny cells, so they're yeah, not necessarily cells, like I said. So these are frag fragments, cell fragments. So you want to count these cell fragments that are smaller than red blood cells. So the materials that you need there, you need gloves, you need improved new blood chamber, you need micro pipettes or white blood cell pipettes, because you can also use red blood cell pipette for, for doing your dilution when you want to do platelet count. So you don't use the white blood cell pipette, you use the red blood cell pipette, which is different from white blood cell pipette. Then you need venous blood, you also need reagents. In this case, the most common reagent that is used is ammonium oxalate. So this ammonium oxalate is a reagent. When you mix it with blood, it's going to destroy the red blood cells. So it will cause lysis of red blood cells so that you, you will be able to count the platelets. Otherwise, if the red blood cells are also there, it's very difficult for you to count platelets because you have so much of these white, uh, red blood cells. So you need a reagent that can destroy the red blood cells. Then you just remain with white, uh, a bit of white blood cells and platelets. So it will be easy for you now to count the platelets. Then of course you need a compound microscope for you to, to magnify the platelets for you to be able to count them. Otherwise with your naked eye, you can't count them. So the procedure, so making a dilution here. So the dilution of blood, it depends with the ratio that you want to dilute the blood, how much reagent you, are, you want to add to the blood sample for you to dilute this blood. So you can, you can have one to two, zero, one dilution, you can have one to 100 dilution, but you just need to take note of that because you're going to factor it in when you want to start calculating the platelets, the actual calculation. So there are two methods. So you can use the micro pipette. So you have these micro pipettes that you can use to do a dilution. So you have one into 201 dilution. So you prepare about four milliliters of diluting fluid. So this is the diluting fluid, which is ammonium oxalate into a tube. Then you prepare 20 microliters of well-mixed and coagulated whole blood into the tube. So you get your blood sample, 20 microliters of your blood sample into the tube. And then you also, you, you need to start by introducing the dilution fluid. So you introduce about four milliliters of ammonium oxalate into the tube, and then you get your blood sample, 20 microliters you introduce, and then you mix. Then you can also use red blood cell pipette, like I said. So you can see here different types of pipettes. You can have red blood cell pipette, white blood cell pipette, and then you have sally pipette. So this sally pipette is, is, is not for, it's not specific for anything. You can just use it to, to pipette smaller quantities of fluids that you want to, to dilute with. So here you can see that you can also use the red blood cell pipette, like I said. So you need to draw blood up to exactly about 0 0.5 mark here. Then you, you, you now draw the diluting fluid up to 101, so up to 0, 101 here. Then you start mixing just like the way we did for red blood cell. You mix for two to three minutes. After mixing, <clears throat> you have made your dilution. Then you start loading your hemocytometer. So you load, you, you load the hemocytometer. So you, you load your, your diluted blood into the hemocytometer. But remember that this uh, dilution fluid you're using is ammonium oxalate, so it's going to destroy all the red blood cells. It's going to cause hemolysis of red blood cells. Then you introduce your solution into the new bar, the improved new bar slide, or which is also called the hemocytometer. Then you place the hemocytometer on the compound microscope. Then using the low power, you just appreciate the rulings within the hemocytometer or the improved new bar chamber. And then how do you now do the counting? So remember, this is, there are nine bigger squares. So the one that you use for counting platelets is similar to the ones that you use for counting red blood cells. So remember, 
At the center here, you have a square, and this square, it's different from these other squares because it contains about 25 smaller squares at the center here. So for red blood cells, we said from these 25 smaller squares, you only count five squares, the ones at the corner and at the center. But for platelets, you count all the 25 smaller squares. So in short, you just count the platelets that are found within this bigger square at the center of the new bar slide. So you have the new bar slide. So you can see you have two portions where you can do your counting. So you have portion one and portion two. So you can count here, then you can count there, and then you get the average so that you have more accurate results. Okay, so even here you have rules that you're going to apply to count the patterns. So remember, so it depends with the way you like. So you just count from the platelets that are touching from two margins and then you left the other two margins. So in this case, if you want, you can say, you count the platelets that are found within the bigger square here, and then you lift, you lift out the platelets that are touching the top margin and the right margin. The other way, you can just count the platelets that are touching the top margin and the left margin. So it depends what you like. So just make sure you count all the cells inside, then you can count not the, cells, the platelets that are found inside the bigger square. Then you also count the platelets that are touching the, the left margin and the bottom, leaving out the top and the right margin. So it's up to you. Just make sure that you just count the platelets that are touching at least the two margins of the square. Okay, so this is just the area one that you're going to count and then you go to the next one, you also count. So how do you do your calculations now after you've counted your platelets? So let's say when you are doing the dilution, you made a dilution of one, two, hundred. So you have made your dilution factor to be hundred. Okay. So you can, you can use different dilutions. So you can use hundred, you can use 200, depending on how flexible you are and also what you like doing in the lab. So from one lab to another lab, there are some differences, but we basically get similar results. Okay, so let's say you've counted from side one and side B. So this is side one and side B. So let's say this is side one, this is side two. Side one, side two, or side A and side B. So you counted cells from side one to be 100 and 66. So these are the number of platelets that you've counted on one side. There were 166 in that bigger square at the center. And then you also count the number of platelets on the other side. Let's say you count 170 platelets on the other side. So the average there, you add the two divided by two. You add the two figures. So 168 plus 170, then it will give you 336. Divide by two, it will give you one sixty eight. So on average, you'll have counted one sixty eight platelets. So this is the average from the two sides: side A, side B, or side say side one and side two. So you factor it in into your calculation now. So the number of platelets calculated. So calculate the count. So the calculated platelets after you counted with the microscope will be equal to the average number of platelets, which is 168 multiplied by the dilution factor divided by the area counted multiplied by the depth. So you can see here, 168 multiplied by the dilution factor, in this case it's 100, divided by the area counted, it's one multiplied by the depth is 0 0.1. So when you do your calculations here, it will give you 168,000 platelets per microliter of blood. 1,068 1, platelets per microliter of blood. So if you compare to the normal range, you say the normal range should be between 150 to 400,000 platelets per microliter of blood. So this is within the normal range. So you know to say that the platelet count are okay. So if it was something that was pointing to dysfunction of platelets, you know to say that the count is okay, then you start looking at the other issue for you to come up with a diagnosis. 
Okay, so I've also provided a short video that is summarizing how you do platelet counts under microscope, so that you can watch at your own time. So we proceed, let's look at hemostasis. So there is also a lot of information here that you need to know, hemostasis. Okay, so hemostasis. So hemostasis, you know to say that it's one of the major function of platelets and these platelets, they are involved in hemostasis. That's why we are discussing hemostasis here. Hemo means blood, stasis means standing or stop. So sometimes when you injure yourself, you start bleeding, but the body has got its own mechanism to stop the bleeding. That stopping of bleeding is called hemostasis. So there's quite of there's quite of pathways and also mechanisms that are involved in hemostasis. So there are various stages of hemostasis. There's primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis that we're going to discuss. So let's start. So what you need to know is that blood must be a fluid. So in the cardiovascular system, you don't want blood to start clotting in the cardiovascular system when there is no damage to the endothelium. Why? It's because you need this blood to be in fluid form to be able to move from one part of the body to the next part of the body. So it has to remain within the fluid form. So if there is damage, you know to say that, there will be coagulation that will be activated. And that coagulation has to be localized so it doesn't affect the entire volume of blood. So it has to be localized and it has to be very rapid and there should be ways in which the body should get rid of that blood clot. Otherwise, if the blood clots will remain within the cardiovascular system, sometimes it can be dislocated. So you have dislocation of these clots that will form uh, thromboembolism and then they will start blocking other blood vessels. So within the body, you also have other systems that are capable of digesting the clot. So we'll be looking at that as well. So, this blood must coagulate at appropriate time. So it's not always that you need to have coagulation of blood. So at, at the appropriate, appropriate time, there is coagulation of blood. So it has to be rapid, like I said, localized and reversible. So you, it has to be reversible because if you still maintain the clot, that can bring other issues, other health issues. So when a blood vessel is injured, a number of physiological mechanisms are activated that promote hemostasis and also the cessation of bleeding. So this hemostasis is the cessation of bleeding or to stop bleeding. So like I said, hemo means blood, stasis means stand or stop. So hemostasis is the process by which the body is going to stop the bleeding. Okay, so we proceed. <clears throat> Breakage of endothelial lining of a vessel exposes collagen proteins from the subendothelial connective tissue to the blood. So once there is exposure of collagen protein, that will result into activation of platelets. So there will be platelet adhesion. So they'll go and adhere to the collagen or they'll go and attach and bind to the collagen. Then after that, there will be platelet aggregation, then plaque formation, platelet plaque formation that will proceed. So this initiates three separate but overlapping hemostatic mechanisms. So these are the hemostatic mechanisms that are involved. The first one, you have vasoconstriction. This vasoconstriction is also called vascular spasm. So vasoconstriction or vascular spasm is whereby when a blood vessel is injured, you will find that there is vasoconstriction. There are certain chemicals that will be released by the endothelium cells, the smooth muscle cells, and also the platelets that will result into vasoconstriction. So this vasoconstriction is going to reduce the diameter of blood vessels, the injured blood vessels, so that you restrict blood flow to that blood vessel. So you are minimizing blood loss once you have vasoconstriction. Then after that, you're going to have the formation of platelet plaque. So this platelet plaque is facilitated by the collagen that is exposed. Platelets, the initial platelets will go and bind and they'll be activated. Once they are activated, they'll start releasing the 
the substances that are contained within the granules, the alpha granules and also the dense granules. So they'll be released. That will, store, that will now start attracting other platelets and activating other platelets to go and attach to the platelets, forming the platelet plug. So you have formation of the platelet plug, and then after that, you have the production of a web of fibrin protein that penetrates and surrounds the platelet plug. So you have, after aggregation of platelets, then you have the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. This is where the coagulation cascade come in, or the co coagulation pathways come in, the intrinsic and the extrinsic, that will later on result into conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin, and this fibrin will polymerize and, and it's going to, to reinforce the, the platelet plug that has been formed so that it's now anchored to the surrounding tissue. So that it's very difficult for this clot now to be dislocated by maybe blood pressure or other factors of the blood. So it will remain contacts like that. And <clears throat> you know to say that this fibrin is also going to help to stabilize the clot itself. So look at all that. So in simple terms, these homeostatic mechanisms, you have three major ones. You have vasoconstriction, which is also called vascular spasm, and then it results into formation of platelet plug. And after that, you have production of fibrin. This fibrin is the one that will form the fibrin mesh network to stabilize the clot. And after that, you know to say that you need to have clot retraction the clot retraction or contraction of the clot so that it becomes smaller. So it will start, this fibrin will start squeezing the clot. That's where you're going to be losing serum from the clot. And serum, you know, to say is plasma without fibrinogen. Then on top of that, you also have other process which is called fibrinolysis. The fibrinolysis is the one that will now start digesting this clot so that it will come back to the normal smooth endothelium. Otherwise, if you're still having this clot, that can also occlude blood vessels. At the same time, it will interfere with the flow of blood. So you find that once blood is coming to hit on this clot, then you have more of turbulent flow of blood. So you want to have more of laminar flow of blood, not turbulent flow of blood. So you find that this is where the fibrinolysis system comes in to digest the clot so that you go back to the smooth level of endothelium so that you have laminar flow of blood that is not obstructed by the clot that has been formed. <clears throat> so let's look at functions of platelets with regard to hemostasis. So functions of platelets with regard to hemostasis. So in the absence of vessel damage, platelets are repelled from each other and from the endothelial lining of vessels. So they are not able to attach, so they're going to repel. Why? It's because there are certain proteins that are found within the endothelial cells. Once they are smooth, the platelets can't attach. There's, there are also enzymes that are inactivating the platelets so that you have just laminar flow or the fluid that is just moving within the cardiovascular system without the platelets attaching. But when there's damage, that's when now things will start changing. So the repulsion of platelets from an intact endothelium is believed to be due to prostacycline. So you have prostacycline, which are special types of prostaglandins that are produced by the endothelial cells. And these will cause platelets not to attach to smooth endothelium. So this is a type of prostaglandin produced within the endothelium, like I say. So the endothelial cells are the ones that are producing prostacycline. And this prosta prostacycline will prevent platelets to attach to normal endothelial tissue. But when there's damage, things will change, like I've already said. So the mechanism that prevents platelets from sticking to the blood vessel and each other are obviously needed to prevent inappropriate blood coating. So if you don't want inappropriate blood coating, you will need these proteins that will prevent these platelets to stick or to bind to endothelium tissue. But when there's damage, this is what will happen now. Damage to the endothelium of, of vessels exposes subendothelial tissue to the blood. Platelets are able to stick to the exposed collagen proteins that have become coated with a protein. And this protein is 
von Willebrand factor that is secreted by the endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells, once they are damaged, they're going to release a protein, which is called von Willebrand factor. And this von Willebrand factor is the one now that is going to attach to platelets. Remember platelets, you have glycoproteins, and these glycoproteins are receptors to von Willebrand factor. So remember, you have glycoprotein one, this glycoprotein one, B is the one that will go and bind to Van Willebrand factor once it has been exposed. Platelets contain secretory granules. When platelets stick to collagen, they degranulate, meaning that they're going to release the contents of the granules. So they're going to degranulate, and then they're going to release their products. So the products that are coming from the granules, you know to say that these products will include adenosine diphosphate, ADP, serotonin, and also a prostaglandin code, which is, which is called the thromboxin A2. So the thromboxin A2 will be released. On top of that, there will be release of ADP, and there will also be release of serotonin. So these factors, they can cause vasoconstriction as well. So they will go and bind to smooth muscles, and then that will result into contraction of smooth muscles. On top of that, they can also bind to receptors that are found within the plasma membrane of platelets. Then they will activate these platelets, they'll become sticky, and then they'll be able to bind other platelets for the formation of platelet plug. So this event is also known as platelet release reaction. So the platelet release reaction is whereby platelets who attach to Van Willebrand factor, then they'll be activated. Once they are activated, they'll start releasing the contents of the granules. So this release of the contents of the granules after activation of platelets is called platelet release reaction. That will attract other platelets and they will also activate the, clot the clotting factors as we'll be discussing. So you have serotonin and thromboxin A2 that will stimulate vasoconstriction, like I said. So these two substances, they can go and stimulate smooth muscle cells to contract. Remember, the cardiovascular wall, you have the endothelial lining, then you have subendothelial matrix, and then you also have smooth muscle cells in the lining. So these substances that are released from platelets, they can go and stimulate the smooth muscle cells to start contracting so that you have vasoconstriction. That's why we are saying, the first stage in hemostasis is vascular spasm. So this is called vascular spasm because there will be contraction of smooth muscle cells after injury. Then you have the phospholipids that are exposed on the platelet membrane that participate in the activation of coating factors. Like I said, the phospholipids will activate the coating factors that will bring about the secondary hemostasis. So the function of platelets here, you're talking of the primary hemostasis, that will form the platelet plug. Then after that, you have activation of the clotting factors that will bring about the secondary hemostasis. So the release of ADP and from boxing A2 from platelets that are stuck to exposed collagen makes other platelets in the vicinity to become sticky. So they'll become sticky so that they adhere to those stuck to the collagen. So you have these platelets that are stuck to the collagen. So they'll start releasing these factors that will activate other platelets and then they'll become sticky and those platelets will be able to go and attach to the other platelets that are attached to the collagen. So this attachment of platelets to the other platelets is called platelet aggregation. So after platelet aggregation, that will, be, that will result in the formation of platelet plaque. So the second layer of platelets in 10 undergoes a platelet release reaction. So they are also going to release ADP and boxing A2 that are secreted, that, are, that will be secreted into circulation and then they will go and activate other platelets to go and attach. So that will result into platelet aggregation to the site where there is injury. So this produces a platelet plug or plug. So it will produce a platelet plug in the damaged vessels, because there are a lot of platelets that will go and attach after activation. So the coating factors that will be activated. So like I said, that once you have the formation of the platelet plug, there will be also activation of the plasma coating factors. So these plasma coating factors that are involved here, you have 
12 major plasma coating factors. But according to numbering, you have number one up to number 13. But there is one factor that is missing, factor six. Why? It's because later on it was discovered that factor five after activation, it was identical to the fa factor six. So it means that factor six was not, was not there, but it's just that people didn't understand to say that after activation of factor five is the one that becomes factor six. So because of that, it was removed. So you only have 12 floating factors as listed in this table. So you have the name of the factor, then the Roman numeral numbering of the factors, and then the function, the pathway in which those factors are involved. So these are 12 major protein factors. So you have factor one, which is called fibrinogen. The fibrinogen, its function to be converted into fibrin that will form the fibrin mesh network to reinforce the platelet plaque. So you have the fibrinogen, it's mainly produced by the liver. Then the pathway in which it's involved, it's a common pathway. Common pathway, it means it's also involved in the extrinsic and intrinsic because the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway, they meet at the level of the common pathway or factor 10, as we'll be discussing pathways later on. Then you have factor two, which is called prothrombin factor that can be converted into thrombin, which is an enzyme. It's involved in pathway, the common pathway. Then factor three, the tissue from boplastin. This tissue from boplastin is also released by the endothelial cells, the damaged endothelial cells. So it's coming from the tissues. That's why it's called the tissue from boplastin, and it's a core factor that is involved in extrinsic pathway. So this is the main factor that is involved in activation of the extrinsic pathway. So it's a core factor. We'll see later on how it involved. Then you have factor. Four, factor four is just calcium ions, and these calcium ions, mainly they are core factors. So calcium is required for the intrinsic and the extrinsic and also the common pathway. So because you need calcium from the intrinsic, extrinsic, and common pathway, if you remove calcium from the blood, you find that blood can't clot. Why? It's because you need calcium for coagulation pathway to proceed. Then you also have pro in protein, this pro in protein is factor five. pro in protein is a core factor, is involved in common pathway. Then you have pro -convertin. So you can see here from factor five, you're moving to factor seven, there is no factor six. Why? It's because factor five, uh, factor six is no longer in the reference. Why? It's because it was believed that the factor five after activation, it became factor six. So the factor six was removed because it was just the activated form of factor five. So it's the same pro accessory protein after activation. That will be factor six. So it's no longer there. That's why we have factor seven now. So this factor seven is called the pro converting. It's, a, it's an enzyme. So it's involved in the intrinsic extrinsic pathway. Then you also have factor eight. This is very common factor because there's a disease in which when you're lacking factor eight, and then you can suffer from hemophilia A. So the factor eight is also called anti-hemophilic factor. So it's anti-hemophilic factor. It's a core factor that is involved in intrinsic pathway. Then you also have factor nine, which is called plasma thromboplastin component or the Christmas factor. So lacking of factor nine, you can also suffer from a disease condition which is called hemophilia B. So hemophilia B is due to lack of factor nine, which is called Christmas factor or plasma thromboplastin component factor. It's an enzyme that is involved in intrinsic pathway. Then you have Stewart, pro factor, the Stewart pro factor is factor 10. This is the most common factor in the coating cascade or coagulation cascade. So the Stewart pro factor is an enzyme that is involved in the common pathway. This is where the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway meet at factor 10, the Stewart pro factor. Then you have factor 11, which is plasma thromboplastin 
the antecedent. So you have plasma thromboplastin antecedent factor. So this factor 11 is an enzyme that is involved in intrinsic pathway. And then you also have factor 12, the Hegeman factor is also an enzyme that is involved in intrinsic pathway. Then you also have factor 13. This is a fibrin stabilizing factor that will result into the formation of cross bridges of fibrin to form that fibrin mesh network that will now cover the clot. So this is an enzyme that is involved in the common pathway. So this is just the naming of the factors, but you also need to know where these factors are coming from. So this other diagram is more comprehensive because it's telling you about the factor number and then the factor name, the nature, the source, and the pathway or the function of that factor. So we we'll go through this again, just to enhance your understanding. So factor one, just not to say is fibrinogen, and this fibrinogen is a plasma protein that is produced by the liver. And it's involved in the common pathway. It will be converted to fibrin, and this fibrin is insoluble web-like substance of clot. So it's the one that will form now the fibrin fibers that will form now that web-like structure around the clot. Then you have factor two, prothrombin, which is a plasma protein that is also produced by the liver. Where you're having a star here, it means it requires vitamin K. So these factors that are produced by the liver with the a star, it means that their production requires vitamin K. So if you have vitamin deficiency, vitamin K deficiency, you can't produce factor two. You can't produce prothrombin because it requires vitamin K. So it's involved in common pathway, converted to thrombin, and thrombin is the one that will convert fibrinogen to fibrin. Factor three, this is tissue factor. It's a plasma membrane glycoprotein, and then it's produced by tissue cells. So those tissue cells, once they are damaged, they will produce and release factor three. And this is the one that is going to activate the extrinsic pathway, like I said earlier on. Then you have factor four, this is calcium, this is an organic ion, it's found within plasma, and it's needed for, essentially, it's needed for all the stages of coagulation, in short. So all the stages of coagulation, you're talking about the extrinsic, intrinsic, you also need calcium. Even the, the common pathway, you also need calcium. So calcium is very important when you're looking at blood coagulation. Then you have factor five, the proaccessinin, which is a plasma protein produced by the liver and platelets. So proaccessinin or factor five is produced by the liver and platelets. It's involved in the common pathway. And then you also have factor six is no longer there. So you can see factor six was removed. So you move to factor seven. Factor seven is pro converting. It's a plasma protein that is produced by the liver. So factor two and also factor seven, you also need vitamin K because there's a star, it's involved in both extrinsic and intrinsic pathway. Then you have factor eight, antihemophilic factor. So this antihemophilic factor is a plasma protein, it's produced by the liver, the lungs, and capillaries. So the liver, the lungs, and the capillaries. Then you also have factor nine. Factor nine is a plasma from a plastin component, which is called the Christmas factor. This Christmas factor is produced by the liver. You also need vitamin K. So it's involved in the intrinsic pathway. So deficiency of the factor nine will result into hemophilia B. Like I said, if you're lacking factor, seven or factor eight, it will result into hemophilia A. Factor nine, hemophilia B. Factor 11, hemophilia C. But there's factor 10 here, which is called Stuart factor. So it's a plasma protein that is produced by the liver. So it also requires vitamin K. Then factor 11, this is plasma thromboplastin antecedent factor that is produced by the liver and it's also involved in the intrinsic pathway. If you lack factor, factor 11, you suffer from hemophilia C. Then you have factor 12, the Hegeman factor. 
It's a plasma protein produced by the liver. It's involved in the intrinsic pathway. So it's going to activate plasmin. Plasmin is the one that is involved in fibrinolysis. Then you have factor 13. Factor 13 is fibrin stabilizing factor. It's a plasma protein. It's produced by the liver and the bone marrow. The one that is responsible for cross links fibrin forming a strong stable cloth, like I said, cross linkages of fibrin. So this, this is just a summary of the factors. There are quite a lot of factors, but I will be able to share with you how you can summarize these factors so that you're able to remember them. Okay, so now let's go into the mechanism of hemostasis because now you understand the factors. So coating factors, formation of the fibrin. So I'll speed up. So how is this fibrin going to be formed? So you need to activate the factors because they're the ones that are involved in the extrinsic, intrinsic, and the common pathway for you to convert fibrinogen into fibrin and the fibrin will polymerize to form the strands of fibrin to reinforce the platelet plug, like I said. So the platelet plug is strengthened by a mesh work of insoluble protein fibers known as fibrin. That cause therefore contain platelets and fibrin and they usually contain trapped red blood cells that give the clot a red color. So in most cases the clot will have a red color because within the clot you have trapping of red blood cell. But you need to understand that if this clot formation is taking place in a blood vessel with a higher blood pressure, you find that there is no trapping of red blood cells in that clot will have more of a gray color. So gray color, it means that this clot is being formed within a blood vessel with a high blood pressure. So there is no trapping of red blood cells. So the color won't be red, it will be more of gray. So finally, contraction of platelet mass in the process of clot retraction forms a more compact and effective plug fluid squeezed from the clot as it retracts is called serum. So once the, the plug is contracting, so the fluid that is squeezed out of the plug is called the serum. And this serum is basically plasma without fibrinogen, the soluble precursor of fibrin. So because the fibrinogen is being used for formation of clots. So when you're squeezing a clot, you won't find fibrinogen. So it's just plasma without fibrinogen. I think this question came in the quiz and most of you got it correct. Then the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin may occur via either of the two initiated pathways. So there are two pathways. You have the extrinsic pathway. So you can see here the, the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. Then on top of these two, you have the common pathway. So you have the common final pathway but the initiated pathways there are two, the intrinsic and the extrinsic. So there are different factors that will stimulate the extrinsic and the intrinsic. The two pathways will meet at the level of factor 10. So these are the pathways. So I, I'll be slow here because you need to understand the pathways that are involved in coagulation. So this is the actual coagulation. So this coagulation of blood, we are talking of the secondary coagulation or hemostasis. The primary one is the involvement of the platelets, you know, the adhesion of platelets, aggregation of platelets, and the secondary hemostasis, this is now the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. That will involve the two pathways, the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway, and the third pathway, which is called the common pathway. So you can see all the three pathways here. You have the extrinsic, which is the shorter pathway, then you have the intrinsic, which is the longer pathway. Then you have the common pathway at the center, which is common to both extrinsic and intrinsic. And the factors that are involved, the clotting factors that are involved. So let's start with the intrinsic pathway. So the intrinsic pathway, the factor that will be activated there is factor 12. So you can see this activation of factor 12. But under normal circumstances, factor 12 is not activated. For it to be activated, it needs to be exposed to collagen or glass or other substances. So if factor 12 is exposed to collagen, glass, and other factors, it will be activated. Once that's been activated, 
it will be transformed into activated factor 12. So you can see factor 12 activated. The activated factor 12 is going to activate factor 11 into the activated factor 11. The activated factor 11 is going to activate factor 9 into the activated factor 9. The factor 9, once activated, is going to facilitate the formation of factor 8 complex. So you know here now that you have the activated factor 9. That will end up activating factor 8. And this factor 8 with factor 9 and other factors, they will form a factor 8 complex. So you can see the factor 8 complex will compose of the activated factor 8 itself, factor 9, which is also activated, then here you also need cofactors like calcium and phospholipids. So this combination of factor eight, factor nine, the activated form, plus calcium and phospholipids, they are called factor eight complex. And this factor eight complex is the one that is going to activate factor 10. So from here, it's going to activate now the common pathway. The common pathway was So you have the activated factor 10 here. So this activated factor 10, you can see now, once factor 10 has been activated into the activated factor 10, it also form a complex. So this complex is called factor five complex. Why you also need factor five here. So factor 10 is also going to activate factor five. This factor five, it will form factor five complex. That will need factor five, the activated factor 10, and also calcium and phospholipids. So this complex, factor five complex, which is made up of factor five, factor 10 activated, calcium and phospholipids, they are going now to convert prothrombin into thrombin. So this is an enzyme that will convert prothrombin into thrombin. The thrombin is also another enzyme that will catalyze the reaction to convert fibrinogen into fibrin, and fibrin will now form fibrin polymer. So this is a common pathway that is involved. Then you also have the extrinsic pathway on this other side. The extrinsic pathway, the activator of this pathway, you need tissue from boplastin. Remember, the factor three is the one that is involved in activating the extrinsic pathway, which is short. The intrinsic pathway, it's a long pathway. It can take about four to six minutes for it to form a fibrin polymer. But the extrinsic is a short form. It will take about, about 36 seconds, somewhere there, for it to form. 30 to 36 seconds. So you can see in the extrinsic, the activator, you need a tissue from the plastin. The tissue from the plastin will activate factor seven. So this factor seven will be activated into factor seven, which is activated. Factor seven activated will form a complex. How? It's because the factor seven now will form factor seven complex once it has been activated. This is where you find the, the activated factor seven with the tissue from the plastic. You also need calcium and phospholipids. So you can see for both pathways, you need calcium here. To form this complex, factor seven complex, the factor seven complex is the one now that will activate factor 10. Factor 10, once activated, the activated factor 10 will activate factor five, and the factor five will form factor five complex, where you need factor five, the activated form of factor 10, calcium and phospholipid. That will also convert the prothrombin into thrombin. The prothrombin, once it has been converted into thrombin, the thrombin will convert fibrinogen into fibrin. And then you will need factor 13. 
factor 13, we said that is a fibrin stabilizing factor that will result into cross bridge formation of the fibrin so that you have the mesh network of the fibrin, then it will stabilize the fibrin. So these are the factors that are involved. So from this complex, it's very difficult to remember. So now, how can you summarize this complex so that you, you can easily remember these complexes? So I'm going to share with you how you can remember that. So when I was still a student, how we could remember these intrinsic and the extrinsic, we had summarized it this way. So I'm going to use this just to summarize the factors. So this is how you can easily remember the pathways. So at the center of the box, you put your factor 10. So this is factor 10. So this factor 10 is the one that is involved in the common pathway. So at the center here, you have factor 10. So this is where your eye is. So how do you remember? So you count from 12 to 10, skipping number 10. So you count from 12, so let's say 12, then you have 11, then you have, you're supposed to have 10 here, but your factor 10, you've already put it at the center. So you're going to skip number 10, so you go to nine, then you're going to eight, then you have number 10. So you are, you are counting downwards from 12. So 12, 11, nine, then you have your 10, which is at the center, then you put eight, then 10. So 12, 11, nine, eight, and your factor 10 at the center. Then this side, you put three and seven. Then down here, you put five, two, and one. So how do you remember this? So this is the intrinsic pathway. This is your extrinsic pathway. This will be your common pathway. So you, you count downwards from, from 12 to eight, skipping number 10. So you have 12, 11, nine, you skip number 10, eight. Then you reach your factor 10, the common pathway. Then the extrinsic pathway, the extrinsic pathway, how do you remember? You just say three plus seven should give you 10. So three, plus seven should give you 10. Then your common pathway, how do you remember it? Five multiplied by two multiplied by one will give you 10. So five multiplied by two multiplied by one should give you 10. So this is the intrinsic pathway, the extrinsic pathway in the common pathway. So you know to say that the extrinsic pathway, once it's exposed to collagen or glass it will be activated the activated factor 12 will go and activate factor 11 the activated factor 11 will activate factor 9 the activated factor 9 will go and activate factor 8 and then the factor 8 complex this is where you need the activated factor 8 factor 9 and calcium and phosphates. So the activated factor eight complex is the one now that is going to activate factor 10 into the active factor 10. The activated factor 10 will go and activate factor five. So this is another complex. So here you have a complex, here you have a complex, and here you have a complex. This is where you also find the function of calcium and phospholipids in the complexes. So you see that once activated factor 10 activates factor five, the factor five will form factor five complex that will also need 
the activated factor 10, factor 5, calcium, and phosphates. In that, we will activate factor 2. Factor 2, the active form of factor 2 is thrombin. So the prothrombin will be activated into thrombin. The thrombin will now activate factor 1, which is fibrinogen. It will convert the fibrinogen into fibrin. And the fibrin will form the fibrin polymer. The extrinsic is very short. So this can take about four to six minutes. This will take about 30 seconds because it's very short. So the one that will take about 30 seconds, you will note that to say that there are few steps that are involved. So here you have the factor three. So this is a tissue factor. The factor three or the tissue factor is going to be, it's going to, to activate factor seven, like we said. So the tissue factor is going to activate factor seven, then factor seven to form a factor seven complex. The factor seven complex, it requires the activated factor seven, it requires the tissue factor, it requires calcium, it also requires phospholipids. So the factor seven complex is the one now that will activate factor 10 into the active factor 10. The activated factor 10, it will activate factor five. The factor five will form factor five complex where you need the activated factor 10, the activated factor five, you also need uh, calcium, you also need phospholipids. That will activate the factor two, or it will convert the prothrombin into thrombin, then the thrombin will convert the fibrinogen into fibrin. So from here, it's the same. So this is where they're going to meet. So that's why this is called the common pathway, because the intrinsic pathway will result into activation of the common pathway. And the extrinsic pathway will also result into the activation of the common pathway. But the intrinsic, it has got more steps that are involved, hence it will take more time for it to complete, four to six minutes. The extrinsic, it's very fast. You can see there's just two steps here, and then the common pathway is activated. So it will take about 30 seconds. So this is how you remember. Okay, so we, we proceed. Okay, so we proceed, that's how you, you'll be able to remember the pathways, the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic path pathway. So it's very easy. So just summarizing everything now. So this is just the general overview of hemostatic mechanisms, the ones that we've already discussed. So here you can see that the first stage here is vascular damage that will result into exposed subendothelium tissue. So these two is called initiation of hemostasis or hemostatic mechanism. So this is initiation. Once you have vascular damage to result into vascular spasm, then there will be exposure of subendothelium. Once you have exposure of subendothelium, it will activate the platelets. That will bring about platelets adhesion. Then you have platelets aggregation that will form the platelet plague or plug, so you have the formation of the platelet plug. So these three steps here, the platelet adhesion, aggregation that will form the platelet plug is called primary hemostasis. So even this can also result into protecting the cardiovascular system so that you don't lose much of the blood to the outside because it will form the platelet plug that will inhibit blood loss. Then after this, this is now where you have the coagulation cascade coming in. That will result into fibrin stabilization. So this is called secondary hemostasis, the activation of those coating factors due to the stage where you have the activation of the common pathway, activated factor eight, then to form the factor five complex, Conversion of prothrombin into thrombin and then thrombin will convert fibrinogen into fibrin. And that will result into the network of fibrin that will polymerize. So polymerization of the fibrin that is called secondary. So in 
primary hemostasis, the primary hemostasis involves the binding of platelets to the exposed collagen in the subendothelial of the damaged vessels. Then you have the secondary hemostasis is a process of activation of coagulation factors leading to the production of thrombin. This thrombin will activate the fibrinogen into fibrin in the fibrin will form the mesh network that will now hold in place the platelet plug. And this plug later on this contraction or retraction of the of the plug that result into losing of serum to the extracellular tissue or into the blood. And you know to say this serum is just plasma without fibrinogen. Then it will reduce in size. Then later on you have other systems that will come in, the fibrinolysis that we'll discuss in the second part of the lecture. So I've also attached a video to summarize the coagulation cascade for you. So at your own time, you look at that. So the next part of the video, we'll look at the system of anticoagulation and fibrinolysis. So for part A, this is where we're going to end.